For unto us is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We're in this Advent series right now, and it's my privilege, as Brett introduced, to take this second week where we will be spending our time unpacking and looking what Scripture has to say about Jesus being the mighty God of Israel. And I've read Isaiah 9, 6 for you, which gets me off the hook for the introduction I was just given. But most of our time is going to be spent taking that thread of mighty God through the Bible and not expositing uh, Isaiah 9, 6. We're going to be looking at what, what Isaiah is revealing here, the promise that Jesus, the sweet little baby born and laid in a manger, was the mighty God of Israel, the creator and the sustainer of everyone and everything. And so this morning, we're going to trace that theme of mighty God. What does it mean that Jesus was and is our mighty God? And we're going to be looking at the immeasurability of God's mightiness and how he is revealed to us in Jesus, our mighty God. And so I want to begin our time by looking at the Apostle Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. Listen to what Paul says. This is his prayer. He's given them this benediction of grace and peace that he desires for them. And then he enters into this prayer for the saints in Ephesus. He says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know. And then Paul's going to name three things. Listen to the three things that Paul wants his saints, Jesus' saints to know. What the Holy Spirit is inspiring this prayer, he wants his people to know. The first thing, the hope to which he has called you. The second thing, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And then listen to this third thing, this third thing that the people of God are supposed to know, this prayer that we would know this this morning. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? What is the immeasurable greatness of his power? We cannot measure the greatness of God's power. We will not draw and simplify and be able to tie a bow on the mightiness of God this morning. But even though our minds cannot comprehend it, even though we cannot fully grasp and understand how all the parts work together, it is the desire of God that we know and worship him in his immeasurableness. It has pleased him to reveal his immeasurable power to us. All throughout the scripture, we see that over and over. And not just the immeasurable greatness of his power, but the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. And Paul goes on to say, it's according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, the same power that we behold from front to back, the terrifying power of God is extended to us, towards us, in the same way that Christ was raised from the dead. We who believe in Jesus have been born from deadness to life, and that is why we praise him. And so this morning, I want us to turn and I want us to look at how God reveals his mightiness all throughout Scripture, 
He does not apologize to reveal his immeasurable mightiness. He wants us to know his arm is not too short. Nothing is impossible for him. Refrain after refrain after refrain. John in his gospel, John the apostle who spent his, his life, his years learning from Jesus, who would call Jesus a friend, when he sees Jesus in glory, he would bow down and worship him. And the apostle John, when he wants to begin his gospel account, about Jesus, he doesn't begin with the baby to be born in a manger. He begins at the very creation of the world. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. God, in the display of His mightiness, wastes no time to draw our attention to the mightiness and what His hands can accomplish. In the very first sentence of the Bible, we behold, in the beginning, that God created the heavens and the earth. But also in this word, we see that he is the God who will unmake them in the final judgment. In Genesis 1, it's refrain after refrain. God commands, God commands, God commands. He is the one who commanded the light to be. But in the days of Moses, he is also the one who commanded the light not to be in Egypt. He is the God who stretched out the heavens, And he is the God who will roll them up like a scroll at the end of all things. He is the God who made the dry land to appear when he separated the waters. But he is also the God who made the dry land disappear in the days of Noah. He is the God who commanded the earth to produce vegetation. But he is also the God who continually sends the rain and himself makes the grass to grow. He is the God who set the stars in the heavens. He is the God who will shake them loose. He is the God who filled the water with living creatures. And he is the God who can, whenever it pleases him, work through such creatures to save his people as in the days of Jonah. He is the God who gives man dominion. And he is the God who holds their dominion together by the word of his own power. Our God is immeasurably mighty. Those statements can splinter off into all kinds of questions that we have, but one thing we need to be clear on is God is pleased to reveal to us the immeasurability of his mightiness. In his word, we understand that it is ultimately God and not gravity that holds the universe together. It is ultimately God and not probability that determines the outcome of the dice. It is ultimately God and not the sun, soil, and water that makes the plants to grow. And it was ultimately God, not Pontius Pilate, who offered up his son to die. We behold a terrifyingly mighty God. And in all those things, the instrument is not undermined, but our God is immeasurably mighty over them. He is not only the creator of everyone and everything, but he is their sustainer. And so a question for us is, what do we do with such a God? How can we relate? How can we be in relationship with such a God like this? How do we hear and receive this from his word, and how are we to respond? And to that, Christian, I invite you, if your faith is strong in this God, who is revealed to us in Jesus, praise him for his mightiness. Behold the wonders, behold what he has accomplished in the creation of the world, in the salvation of his people. Behold it and ascribe him praise to those who are hostile when they hear this, to those who don't like the idea of a God who is in control at their expense, to those, I challenge you, such were many of us in this room. But graciously, he extends his hand to us that if we would bend our knee, if we would bow before him and put our trust in him, eternal life belongs to such as you to those who are apathetic, to those who hear these things and it registers nothing. Yeah, 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 God is mighty. That's fine, but I'm going to go do my thing now. Behold and tremor beneath the mightiness of God that is revealed to us. 
He is mighty to save and he is mighty to judge. He will return and we will kiss the sun or we will perish in the way. And friend, to those who are weak in their faith, to those who believe and trust in God's faithfulness, but you are weak as you look at your sin-stained flesh and it terrifies you that we have such a mighty God. To you, I invite, take refuge in the mighty God of Israel. He is a God of terrible and destructive and terrifying power, but he is a God who is good and merciful. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. Put your trust in him. Be stirred and be reminded that the mightiness of God is not to be a terror for his children, but it is to be our strong and steadfast hope that if we have taken our refuge in him, no one can rip us out of his hands. He is the creator and he is the sustainer of everyone and everything. He possesses not only the authority to command with his word, but he is the God who watches over his word to perform it. So imagine with me in the creation count, the shock and the awe of the angels as they beheld the mightiness of God on display. God commands the light to shine in the darkness and the light obeys him. He commands the waters to separate and they obey. He commands the waters under the heaven to be gathered together, and they obey. He commands the earth to produce vegetation, and the earth obeys. He commands the stars to take their place in the heavens, and the stars obey. He commands living creatures to fill the water and sky, and they obey him. He commands the earth to bring forth living creatures, and it obeys. Then he reaches down into the soil. And he creates man in his own image. Male and female, he sets them apart. He sets them up as his image bearers before the whole creation. That the entire creation would look and know what their God is like. And he takes them and he commands them and they disobey. He promised death for such. And to death he turns them over. From dust they were made, and to dust they shall return. So the mighty Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, the one to whom all authority belongs, and when he speaks, his creation obeys. He comes down to deal with the man and woman, to delve out the curse that he promised. And he begins with a word of promise. We read this in, in Genesis 3, 15. Here's the promise that God offers to his disobedient creation. He tells them a child will be born. He tells them that a son will be given, and this son will crush the head of the serpent that deceived Eve. We turn in Genesis 5 and we behold this narrative over and over and over again as we trace the genealogy from Adam down to Noah. We read these words over and over, this refrain. We read, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. Moses, if he just wanted to list a genealogy, he doesn't have to include that. That's not included in our genealogies all over the rest of Scripture. But what Moses is showing us, what the Holy Spirit is teaching us through Moses, we are seeing the depravity of the fall, that through Adam came sin, and through sin came death, and death spread to all men because all sinned. But after the fall, after Adam and Eve were cut off and cast out of the garden, their descendants all succumb to the same fate. They're handed over to this mighty enemy, death, and death claims its spoil in case after case. But there's something else for us to behold in Genesis 5. 
Genesis 5 is not just a story that is meant to be our doom and gloom and to sadden us, but in Genesis 5, we also read this refrain etched in with the rest. In every single case, we read over and over, and he died, and he died, and he died. But before that, every single time, we read the words, and he fathered, he fathered, he fathered. It doesn't have to say that. I think to our shame, we take that for granted as we look back through the lens of the generations we know have come before us. But we should be shocked by those words. That does not have to be the case. When Lot's wife committed the sin of looking back, she was turned into a pillar of salt like that. That's Genesis 19. When Aaron's sons offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, they were consumed like that. That's Leviticus 10.1. When Uzzah touched the ark, God struck him down like that in 2 Samuel 6. When Ananias lied, he breathed his last like that in Acts 5, and his wife fared no better. He is a mighty God, and he is powerful and in control But in the case of Adam and Eve, instead of instantly perishing and being wiped off the earth, sparing creation the groaning of their bondage to decay to this very day, they receive this promise. And in Genesis 5, we see the mighty enemy death claiming his spoils over and over. But what we also see is the mighty God the creator of heaven and earth, the God who watches over his word to perform it, sustaining his remnant until his promise is fulfilled. Mankind would be handed over to death. Death would rule and reign. The entire creation groans under its subjection to decay, but all the while our mighty God still reigns. Death can't stop him from preserving his remnant. Death cannot even claim the single life of a sparrow without the decree and permission of our mighty God. Those remnant would be hacked to the stump time and time again. They would not be cut off until the promised child was born, until the promised son was given. We see this theme all through the scriptures. God delights himself to reveal and to show to us his mightiness. In the creation, he shows this display and he commands them, in six days I created the heavens and the earth. And he commands the man and the woman to rest, just as he rested on the seventh day, that we might remember his mightiness and that we might remind ourselves perpetually that it is not up to our planting and our watering. It is God who causes the increase. He wants his people to rest in him. In Pharaoh's day, God tells Pharaoh, I've raised you up for this purpose, that I might display my power to you into the entire ends of the earth. God wants to be glorified in the demonstration of his power. When the people are led into the promised land, after the the land of Canaan has been evacuated, the Lord comes to them, and though they've battled, though they've taken up the sword, the Lord reminds them, it was I who led you in here. It was I who led you out of Egypt. It was I who cast out the Canaanites before you, and you dwell in homes you did not build. Do not forget the mighty working of my hand that I've displayed. Joshua dies, and tragically, we turn to judges, and we see the people forget. But God raises up a judge, and for a time they remember, but then the judge dies, and they forget again. And then God raises up another judge, and for a season they remember, but with the death of the judge, they forget again. God raises up one such judge, and Isaiah even points to him in Isaiah chapter 9, Gideon. This man through whom God will display his might and receive all the glory. God finds Gideon hiding in the wine press, and he comes to him, and it almost sounds patronizing. 
to this little man cowering in the wine press, afraid of the Philistines, he calls him mighty man of valor. And he commands Gideon. Gideon assembles an army. Through Gideon, God is going to judge and God is going to fight back the enemies of God's people. But God comes to him and says, the army is too big. You defeat them with this army and the people will forget me. The people won't recognize and ascribe glory to my mightiness in this. And so he whittles the number down to 300. Unless we think of a Spartan king and his fierce 300 soldiers who valiantly do battle, that's not what's happening in this story. Though you may have been taught that uh, in younger years. This is Gideon, and God commands, I'm going to choose 300 men. And here's how you're going to know who the men are that I choose. I want you to take them down, and I want you to watch the way they drink water. And so God, they take them down. Gideon watches, and God says, Every soldier that laps the water with his tongue like a dog, that's who I want you to fight with. I don't know if you've ever seen a dog lap water with his tongue. It looks like this. I don't know if there's a correlation. In fact, I know. There is no correlation between lapping water like a dog and being a mighty soldier, valiant in battle. But if it's me and I had to choose, I would go with the correlation of, God, can I please have the normal people who drink water like a normal person? God takes the 300 dog lap, the tongue lappers like a dog, and he sets them against this immeasurable army. He gives them pots to bang and to crush. And God, the mighty God of Israel, overthrows and defeats an army through them. Gideon watches this firsthand, but tragically, even in the life of Gideon, he would be succumbed by cheap counterfeits before even he passed out of this earth. And when Gideon died, the generation after him would not remember. Friends, I know nothing I'm saying this morning is new to us. We know that God is mighty. You can't have beheld any page in the Scripture and not have come to the conclusion that we worship a mighty God. But our problem, even though we know this, is that ours and the generations who've come before us, how quickly we are to forget such things. Do we really live like we have a mighty God who is the creator and sustainer of his creation? Do our lives reflect in the things we're anxious about, in the things that scare us, in the things that worry us, that we worship a God who not only makes incredible promises to us, but watches over his word and performs it? Christian, what scares you? For some of us young parents, we are so worried that we aren't doing this right or well enough. Trying to figure out how to do parenting, and once the clock starts, there's no going back. For some of you, your kids are grown and old, and it's not days ahead that you worry about, but the days behind, the mistakes you've made that plague you with anxiety. For some of you, it may be your ability to provide day after day after day. How long will your strength hold out to be able to provide for the ones that you love and to care for them? Friend, I don't know what it is, but the message of God's mightiness. If this really is our God and we worship him in the same might with which he raised Jesus from the dead is already at work within us, then our anxiety is incompatible with our answer to Paul's prayer that we know the immeasurableness of his mighty power. Lest we look back at Israel, lest we look at all these stories and they say, what foolish idiots. How do they forget and forget and forget? We are reminded that it is not 
As we look to the natural branches, we are charged not to be arrogant, but to remember that the same mighty hand that cleaved them off of the tree of God's people is the same mighty hand that has cleaved us in by faith. Jesus is a mighty Savior. And through all of these years, this promise to Adam and Eve that a child would be born, through all of these years, this promise that a son would be given, through all of these children who are born, even these seemingly mighty men who raise up, but they're displayed to be insufficient, insufficient, insufficient. God displaying his mightiness, God displaying his faithfulness, God displaying his goodness. We behold men through whom God does incredible things. But even to Moses, he cannot lay down his life for the people. Even Joshua, God would use him to lead the people into the promised land, but he dies and he cannot continue to reign and set the people to remember the mightiness of God. Even kings like David, who have a heart after God's own heart, would give birth to sons who would turn their backs on him. Even Solomon, quite possibly the wisest man ever to live in all of his wisdom, would be allured by cheap counterfeits. Even mighty men like Samson would be crushed when they forgot where their true might came from. And in the story after story after story, we're yearning for a better son. We're yearning for a better child. We're yearning for the one. As the tree of God's people is hacked down again and again. In Isaiah, we read that even when only a tenth remains, it'll be cast back into the fire to be burned down. But all the while, God will continue to preserve his remnant. And into this darkness shines forth the words of Isaiah 9, 6. The promised child to Eve will be born. The promised son to Eve will be given. He will sit on the throne of David. He will be none other than the mighty God himself who made such promises. He will come and put on flesh and live among us to perform it himself. His name is Jesus. The Jew scoffed at that answer. Jesus? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Jesus, the illegitimate son of Joseph? Jesus, the man crucified with criminals, nailed to the tree as a sign of God's curse upon him. Jesus Christ crucified is a stumbling block for the Jew precisely for this reason, the mightiness of God. But lest we swing the pendulum and we create an alternate version of Jesus, our job is not to present the soft, meek, adorable Jesus that is worth our adoration and to set our minds upon during seasons like this in the year. We worship the almighty God who became a baby and was swaddled and laid in an animal's feed trough. What we profess is that the mighty God who would The mighty God is born in the little town of Bethlehem, where he's swaddled and laid in the manger. The son that would be given is given into the hands of a mob who would cry, crucify him, crucify him. The Almighty, in whose hand the king's heart is a stream of water, would stand before kings and allow them to sentence him to death. Jesus was the Almighty, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the one who holds thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities together by the word of his power. And yet he would stand and allow the authorities come together to flog him. 
The government was resting upon his shoulders when he allowed the government to lay a cross on his. The Almighty God, whose arm is not short, to whom nothing is impossible for him, veiled in flesh, he would stagger beneath the weight of the cross. Having been beaten and bruised, he would need help to take the cross to its appointed place. But all the while, the same Jesus was restraining the hosts of heaven by the word of his power, who but for his might would have rushed in to save him. He would be nailed to a tree that he caused to be sprouted out of the ground. The soldiers would cast lots for his garments while he hung on the tree, but their every decision would come from him. With nothing left to harm him, the criminals at his side would tear him down by their words. But with all the might and the authority in the universe to reciprocate harm upon them, Jesus would secure his salvation by his own word. On the cross, the might of Jesus was spent, not bearing with the pain and suffering of the nails through his body, but enduring the cup of God's wrath poured full strength on him in place of those in this room who believe. Then breathing his last, the snake crusher promised to Eve would take death by the throat and drag him to his own grave, where he would swallow him whole, only to rise again on the third day and declare the victory to his disciples. Friends, we know these stories, but we need to be reminded of who this Jesus is. He's not a martyr for us to look and, and emulate and adore. He's the mighty God of Israel who veiled himself in flesh to save his people. He is the great promise giver who watches over his word and has once for all come to perform it. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our hope. Jesus is our mighty God. We put our faith in him because he is mighty to save. When we take our refuge in him, our anxieties are cast aside. Jesus' message to us is take my yoke. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Trade with me. For in the things that you're carrying, cast them before the cross the mighty God of Israel extends his hand and he wants them. Put your faith in him and you will never be put to shame. May Jesus be glorified this Christmas as you live in the fullness of the perfect peace that was purchased for you. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you are the God who not only makes such incredible promises to us, but you are the mighty God who watches over your word to perform it. God, that we have not only to hold out hope that you will one day do these things, but in the gospel we behold what you have already done. And if we would just bend the knee before the mighty God revealed to us in Jesus, we will be saved. God, nothing in our hands do we bring. Thank you for sending your Son and accomplishing it all on the cross. We pray to you and ask these things in his name. Amen.